Awesome. You guys can be seated. Cool. So we are continuing in Luke today. Thank you, Holly. Um, and as you can see, it's a real fun passage. Um, and so I'm, yeah, man, okay. So here's, here's the thing about uh, today's story that gives me pause, and, 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 and here's my fear about today. Um, typically, when we preach about things like this, demons, uh, spiritual warfare, uh, we have kind of two reactions that I see are the most popular. Um, the first one is people get a little too excited, like finally he's talking about demons and stuff, and they're like just really excited about it, and uh, because uh, we can err on the side that like uh, demons and, and, and spiritual warfare is behind every single thing, and and this, I kind of have this mentality of like Satan made me do it, and, and, and demons are just like, you know, all these things where it's kind of like we're just, we, we blame everything on demons, spiritual warfare, and, and take no responsibility for our part in things. Um, and then some folks are like, man, he's talking about demons too much. He might have one, and uh, I'm not sure what's going on. And so like, I mean, like, so here's the thing. This is one of the reasons we preach verse by verse through, through books of the Bible, primarily at the Grove, because uh, it, it stops me from avoiding things that I would rather not preach on. So while, while I think this is going to be really good for us, uh, I want you guys to hear the, the, the main point of the passage today and, and see what Luke, uh, the Holy Spirit through Luke, is trying to, to, uh, to do for us and show us. Um, but to do that, I feel like we got to do some work about demons, Satan, and, and enemies. So we've got a lot to do today in a short amount of time. Uh, so we're just going uh, to get into it. Uh, and the reasons why I want to do some of this work before we even jump into the text uh, is because um, a couple things. Uh, I don't want any of this to scare you guys, especially y'all who are Christians, okay? Um, he, here's the reason why I don't want to scare, or why I don't think it should scare you to talk about uh, the real war that we find ourselves in. Uh, the very real spiritual presence that we are in the midst of in, on this earth, um, it should not, that kind of danger should not invoke fear uh, because uh, all of us know that if I was to stand on the middle of the interstate, that that would be dangerous, and no one's afraid of that. Like, no one wakes up in the morning like, I could wind up in the middle of the interstate today and get hit by a car. Like, you just, you, there's a lot of choices you're making to get there, right? And so, like, there's a lot of things you're going to be doing to find yourself in the middle of the interstate, not in a car. Um, and so, so, one of the things I want you guys just to see is that, like, having a knowledge of this doesn't have to invoke fear. In fact, it could inform the decisions you make in your life so you don't wind up in a place like that. And so, if we, if we can understand the war that's going on around us and that we're a part of, and understand the protections that God has afforded to his people, then maybe we won't wind up on the interstate getting hit by a car, Right? And then, and then secondly, if you're here today and you're like, I haven't thought about demons since the last time you preached about demons, and I've just like never even crosses my mind, and I just feel safe all the time, why are we bringing this up? Uh, well, because um, if you don't understand what's going on around you, you'll never treasure the one who's protecting you. Like if you don't understand the danger that you find yourselves in, then there's no glory for the one who's keeping that danger at bay, right? And so we have to understand what's happening around us so we can worship, glory, God rightly for what he's actually doing for you who feel safe. So, um, God, at some point, we don't, there's going to be a lot of I don't knows today. Um, and so I just need you guys to understand that the Bible tells us everything we need to know about life and about godliness. It doesn't tell us everything we want to know. But at some point, God created angels. Angels are created beings, okay? You guys know that? Angels... Um, they're not eternal, they're not forever, they haven't always been, they don't always will be, but angels are created beings, don't know when God created them, tend to think probably before um, cr other creation, before us for sure, um, and so uh, they were created primarily to worship God, and then a, a, and the, and through the course of creation and, 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 and uh, the story of redemption, God has given them sp other specific tasks, which we'll get to in a second. Um, what, one of the, well, let's get to right now. One of the tasks in Hebrews chapter 1 uh, is actually where people get the idea of guardian angels from. Uh, in Hebrews chapter 1, 14, uh, we learn that God has sent angels to minister to those who have received salvation. Um, we don't, like, the whole guardian angel idea starts to get weird because it, it assumes a lot of things, like there's a one-for-one -one correlation, or for every person, every saved person, there's an angel and all these things. We don't know that. 
Um, some of you guys might need a lot of angels ministering to you. Some of you guys might not need as many. So like, I wouldn't just jump on like there's a one-for-one one thing. But what we do know is that, is that part of them worshiping God is ministering to his people. Okay? And so this is what they do. They worship God. And at some point, um, maybe in Isaiah and Ezekiel, definitely in Revelation, we see that a war broke out in heaven because there was, there was some um, angels who, uh, in their pride, in their um, selfishness, wanted to be worshipped instead of worshipping God. And a war broke out, and um, apparently there's some... Uh, some sort of hierarchical structure in, in the ranks of angels. And um, Michael, the archangel, has cast uh, Satan, the leader of this rebellion, and his, his angels that followed him down to this earth. And I know this, a lot of you guys are like, this sounds like a fantasy story. Is this Lord of the Rings or is this, you know, this is, this is, this is what scripture tells us, okay? So there's this, there's this stuff going on, and, and, and they rebel against God, and a war breaks out. And, and to be fair, uh, when God is on one side of a war, it's not a real, like, war, like, oh, who's going to win, right? Like, like it, Satan is not God's equal, and you need to know that. I know when you watch things like The Exorcism, which I don't recommend you watching, but if you watch things like The Exorcism, what you see is, like, a demonic or a, someone who's demonized and uh, a priest just getting, getting worked by the demonized person, right? And that starts to, to, to kind of give us a framework to think about demon, demonization, um, and to think that, you know, God's people and demons are, are equal and like they're fighting and, and there's this war. But like it's not, God, God does what God wants to do. Okay, we saw, we'll see here that they need permission to do things. Okay, so God's in control. But a, but a rebellion breaks out, a war breaks out, and they are cast down to earth. We believe this is before uh, creation or before the Garden of Eden because what happens is now Satan on earth in the garden tempts Eve, right? And Adam. And they eat of the fruit, and then, and then evil comes into our world. So what we find ourselves in is a world where everyone agrees on, on a couple things, and then Christians have, have something that's kind of unique. Everyone agrees, agrees that the, we are physical, and we are like mental, right? So we have a physical body, and our physical body can have physical ailments. We can be healthy, we can be unhealthy, all these things. And then also we have this idea that we also have a mind, and our mind could be healthy, we could be thinking rightly, uh, but our mind can also be unhealthy. And we could have disorders, or diseases, or, in, or chemical imbalances, and all these things. And what we believe as Christians is that you also have a soul, and there's also, spir there's also a spiritual um, realm, or sp spiritual things going on in us, and around us, and we find ourselves in the midst of that today, in 2021. And so, so you have angels, and then you have angels who rebelled, cast down to earth, and now you have Satan, and you have these other angels, which are characterized in the New Testament as demons. And so we find ourselves in this war, and we have a real enemy and Ephesians tells us that our enemy is not flesh and blood, but it's these powers, these rulers, these principalities, these, these spiritual things, these demons. The enemy, our enemy is Satan and his demons. And so, so then, then you have, okay, well, what, do, what do demons do? What does Satan do? And so he, here's what I want to kind of do some work and talk about what Satan, how Satan works. Because uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11 tells us, that Satan will not outwit us if we understand his schemes. So Satan has schemes, he has plans, he has ways that he wants to work, and he will not outwit us if we understand what those are. So there's a war between God and Satan, between the, between, um, the eternal king of the universe and a created being. So, so even just that should tell you how the end's going to look. But Revelation, God in his kindness gave us a book uh, of the book of Revelation to show us the end, and the end is God wins. But then also we see these different names for Satan throughout the New Testament, and these names give us some ideas of how he works. So in Revelation chapter 12, verse 10, Satan is called the accuser of God's children. So Satan accuses. 
Now, he accuses God's children. So here's how I want you to, to really understand how demonic forces work in your life, is they will, if you're a Christian, they will accuse you of things. I think we've all heard things like this in our own mind, right? We hear, you're not good enough, you're, no one likes you, um, no one cares. If you, if you share that sin at home group, if you confess that sin with your spouse, that's not going to, that's like, like whew, you're going to get divorced, everyone's going to hate you, no one will be, your, like, all these accusations, they condemn you, you are, God does not love you, you have gone too far, these accusations. And so, some of that can absolutely be you, it can be your flesh, your, um, your mind doing those things, but also, that can absolutely be demonic forces at work whispering those things into your, your mind, he is the accuser. And we know, specifically, Romans 8 tells us there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. 1 Peter 5.8 calls Satan the adversary. He works as our adversary. He, he's trying to destroy you. He's trying to destroy you. He's opposed to you in every way. He's trying to convince you to follow the ways of the world. Um, Revelation 9.11 also calls him the destroyer. Revelation 12.9 calls him the deceiver, that he deceives God's people. Um, it's one of the reasons we're not just in dispute, like just vague spirituality, because not every spirit is of God, that we need to, uh, uh, John tells us to test the spirits. In John 8, 44, he, he's called, Jesus calls him the father of lies. The father of lies. Now, now this is important because I want you guys to hear me. Um, that's why the Bible says not to lie. When you lie, you are speaking a demonic language. It's just, it's, it's, he's the father of lies. It's the language he speaks. So when you lie, you're speaking a demonic language. When you listen to and believe lies, you're listening to and believing a demonic language. So, so for those of you who um, hear lies and accusations about who you are, what you've done, um, what you can do, and what the Lord would have for you, those, those lies are demonic. This is how Satan works. He's the tempter. First Thessalonians 2 5 calls him the tempter. He tempts us. He cannot make you sin. The idea that Satan uh, makes people do anything is not, is not biblical. But he tempts you to join the darkness, to align with him. Uh, John 8 44 calls him the murderer. He wants you to die. Um, it's one thing I wish everyone could just understand is that uh, Satan is tempting you to sin. And he's tempting you to sin because he wants you to die. And sin will kill you. Like that's, that, that is what sin wants to do. Sin wants to kill you. And so when we, when we play around with sin and we're like, I know that's not a big deal. Or I, this is actually a source of joy for me. I don't want to get rid of this sin. I like this. Whatever it is, whether it's a relationship you're in you know you shouldn't be in. Or it's a thing you partake in or something you look on your computer screen you know you should be looking at. Whatever that sin is that you think isn't that big of a deal, everyone does it wants to kill you, and the reason why Satan would tempt you with that is because he wants you dead. He is a murderer. Matthew 13 calls him, the, or Jesus calls him the evil one. And this is the, this is the thing that I want people to really see, um, is that I think everyone agrees there's evil in our world. And what we're saying is there is an evil one in our world who wants to see that evil grow and the kingdom of darkness continue to grow. Matthew 13, also, Jesus also calls him the enemy, further language that, um, that Satan is our enemy. Our enemy is not God. Our enemy is not one another. Our enemy, our enemy is not Islam. It's not Mormonism. It's not all these other things. Our enemy is Satan. Our enemy is not the Democratic Party. It's not the Republican Party. Our enemy is Satan. You've got to see that. Our enemy is demonic forces. Our enemy is the kingdom of darkness. 
And with that kind of sobering realization of what Satan wants to do to you and that he does do that, I want us to read this text, okay? So Jesus, he's teaching. He is teaching about, about the kingdom of God. He, he just got done calling. He, he's like, hey guys, let's go, let's get in the shore, uh, or let's get in the boat and let's go to the other side of the lake uh, or the sea and, uh, and let's, 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 let's go over there. And he falls asleep, a storm comes, the disciples start just freaking out and they're like, Jesus, we're all gonna die. You gotta do something. And why are you sleeping? And so he wakes up, rebukes the wind and the waves and they cease, gets to shore, gets, out of, gets off the boat and is met by a demonized man. Now, like, this is just, this is what's happening. So, then he sailed to the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. When Jesus had stepped out on land, there met him a man from the city who had demons. For a long time, he had worn no clothes. He had not lived in a house, but among the tombs. So, dude's not doing very well, right? I don't know what you guys know about being outside among tombs, not wearing clothes for a long time but things aren't going well at that point, okay? Um, and, so, and so it says he had demons. I want, I want to do a little, bit, a little bit more groundwork before we jump right into this. Um, later, it's going to say, even in our ESV, which we love, it's going to say demon-possessed or possessed by demons. Um, it should have like a little number, an asterisk or something, and go down like, hey, sometimes it's actually translated as this. Uh, here's the thing I want you guys to hear about demon possession and the scary idea of demon possession, okay? There is no Greek word in the New Testament that is, means demon possession. It is an English translation that was made up in the 1500s and 1600s to try, and to, um, to try and convey what the Greeks were, what, what Luke, what Matthew, what Mark what would have been writing would have been saying, and so they came up with this idea of demon possession, which was fine until movies. And the movies come out, and then, and then tells us what, what demon possession looks like. And so we have an idea of what demon possession looks like in our mind, um, and, and we'd, we probably don't get that from here. We get that from movies we've watched. We get it from, from things we've seen or YouTube videos we've watched, because YouTube videos are always a good source of, uh, of information, right? So... We're going to use the term demonized. Demonized. It, literally, the, the, the Greek word just translates to one of three things. It's like had demons, has demons, or was with demons. Right? So this person had demons. It was with demons. And so, so then the question, can, are, was the demon inside him? Was it on him? How does it work? Uh, probably inside him, it seemed like. That would explain his superhuman strength, especially how many demons it could have been. Um, based on his name and things. We'll get to that, but, but the demon um, uh, possession, I don't want you to think exorcism and like, like necks spinning around and all that weird stuff, okay? But at the same time, this is, wasn't good. The man, was, the man was living among the tombs. He wasn't in the city anymore. Um, and it's not because of sulfur and weird things. Like, don't freak out. Um, it, it, it's just, you, you, like, man, like, this is just where people, you can't be anywhere else. They tried to restrain him with shackles and things, and it just wasn't working out. Um, so, they, so, so he's in the tombs. He's got no clothes. He hasn't lived in the house for a long time. Uh, Jesus gets off the boat, and there he is. So Jesus is getting the rest he wanted, right? He's like, let's get away from the crowds. And then it's like, let's go right to the demon, demon, demonized guy. So, so he's living among the tombs. He's probably got like just like long, gross hair, beard. Um, he's naked. He's among the tombs. Not a good look for anyone. When, when he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him and said with a loud voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, do not torment me. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. So, so Jesus commands the unclean spirit to come out of the man. He falls down and he cries out with a loud voice and calls Jesus. What does he call Jesus? The son of the most high God. 
demons have a highly accurate, correct Christ- Christology. Like they know who Christ is. They know how powerful he is. He know, he knows that, they know that he's the son of the most high God, and yet they don't follow him. They don't love him. But they know all the right stuff about him. You can know and be able to repeat all the right stuff about Jesus, and that doesn't matter at all. Right? So in this section of Scripture, Jesus is saying, it's not just about hearing my words, hearing my voice. It's about hearing them and doing it. Hearing it and doing it, right? It's about actually following me, loving me, obeying me, right? And so, and so they have this, this correct Christology, this correct idea of who Jesus is, what he has come to do. They know at some point the other Gospels that tell the story, um, they, they talk about it not being the time yet to be tormented. So they know, they know that, tor- that uh, tormenting is coming, they're saying, have you, have you come to do this before it's time? So we, we, we need to be careful that we're not just people who have the right thoughts and beliefs about Jesus, but we're people who love him, who hear his voice and love him and follow him. For he commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man, verse 29, for many a time it had seized him, he was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles, but he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the desert. So, so the, 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 um, the town, the city, had, has tried to restrain him, but he's, he's breaking out of the bonds, breaking out of the shackles, and he, they can't keep him. And so the demon would, would drive him into the desert. Verse 30, Jesus then asked him, what is your name? And he said, Legion. For many demons had entered him. Legion is a Roman term for um, a, a military unit. Um, people disagree on the exact number, uh, but it's in the thousands for sure. 1,000, 2,000, possibly upwards of as many as 6,000 in a military unit. It does not mean that there was 6,000 demons in this man. Uh, we should not listen to a demon and think he's telling us the truth, right? Um, just a quick thing about demons, they lie. They're boastful. They like to talk big about themselves. That's what got them into trouble in the first place. But there was certainly more than one demon because Luke tells us, not just his name, he also tells us many demons had injured him, which explains his superhuman strength, being able to break the bonds, the shackles, the chains that the town tried to restrain him with. And verse 31 says, And they begged him not to command them to depart into the abyss. And so they know that there's a place for them. And that place is what we call hell. And Jesus talks about hell more than any other place in the Bible. Jesus mentions hell. And it's a real place, and it's a place of torment. That's why they said, if you come to torment us, please don't cast us into the abyss. And it's a place where those who do not want to follow God end up. And the demons who do not want to follow God know that they can be cast into the abyss, and they're asking him not to do that. Verse 32, Now a large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him to let them enter these, so he gave them permission. Now the idea that there was pigs there means this was not uh, a place that was following God. Uh, In the Old Testament, pigs were considered unclean. So not only did the Jewish people, the people who were following God at that time, uh, not eat them, they wouldn't even touch them, and so they would, certainly wouldn't raise them. And so Jesus had crossed from, uh, from one side of Galilee into a pagan side of Galilee, into a, a non-believing side of, of Galilee, um, the eastern shore. And, and there's, these are some Greek cities. And, uh, and so these people do not believe, and they have pigs. They have a lot of pigs. Um, and so they're begging to be, to be put into the pigs. And so... Jesus gives them permission, which, just a side note, they needed permission to do that. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and drowned. When the herdsmen saw what had happened, they fled and told it in the city and in the country. Then people went out to see what had happened, and they came to Jesus and found the man whom the demons had gone sitting at the feet of Jesus. 
clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. All right. So let's, let's back up and let's talk about this. Demon, Jesus gets out, out of the boat, onto the shore. There's a demonized man. And he, he, they've tried to restrain him. He breaks out of those things. He's not in his right mind because later we see that later he is in his right mind. So he wasn't then. And he had these demons in him. Now, what does that look like today? Does that happen today? I, I think it does. I think one of the things that we've tried to do is we've tried to solve so many of people's uh, ailments with, with medicine and with, 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 uh, with um, non-biblical-based counseling because we, we, there's so much that we cannot explain as humans. Now, I know some of these, some of these disorders are very real, and so I, guys, I need you to hear me carefully today. Uh, I'm, I'm, I know that the, there are real mental illnesses that people can have and do have. But sometimes it can be demonic. And so I know that when, when people have some sort of traumatic event in their life, that they can have something like a, a disassociative uh, personality disorder where they have uh, multiple personalities. And, that, and that's true. People, you can create a, a personality to try and hide yourself from the traumatic event and not think about that again. Um, but also... That can be demonic. Sometimes people aren't just hearing voices, they're hearing something very real. And because we think that that can't be possible, we just want to give them medicine and put them in the place. Right? And that, and that could be very real, and sometimes medicine helps. But other times, it could be demonic. So, so, so one of the things people ask is, how come we don't see demonization today? And, the, and, and I think the reality is we, we do. It's just our world calls it something else. And so this is very real, and this still happens. And, and, and these people are the people Jesus came to set free. Earlier in Luke, if you've been with us, Jesus goes into the temple, or goes into the synagogue, he grabs the scroll, unrolls it, and he reads from it. And one of the things he reads that he's going to do as the Messiah is he's going to set the captives free. We are in a very real war, and there are captives. And Jesus has come to set those captives free to where people can be in their right mind. Because think about this guy. He's, he's not been clothed in years. He's, he's now he's been in a home. He, he's been just living in the tombs. And this is, this is how the city sees Like all the kids probably know of him. That crazy guy, don't go near the graveyard because the crazy guy's there. We've tried to, you know, we tried to shackle him up, but we can't, right? So don't go near, so all the kids, but, but then all these pigs die. So, so what happens is the economics uh, of this town, they're making, they're making money through ways that God would not have them make money. And that freaks them out more than the demonized guy. So now everyone comes to see the demonized guy and what happened and what do they see? They, they, see, they, they see the guy with like crazy hair and, 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 and naked and just, and just living in the tombs going crazy. No, no, no. You know what they see? Dude's clothed, cleaned up. Now he's at Bible college. He's learning. <laughs> he's sitting at the feet of Jesus, just taking notes, writing stuff down, right? Like this is, th this is who this man is now. He goes from crazy, out of his mind, needs to be shackled to... <laughs> In seminary, following Jesus, learning stuff, wanting to follow Jesus. This is, this is what Jesus has come to do, to set the captives free that have been taken in this war. Jesus is a missionary. He travels over the sea to another people group to set them free, to bring the gospel to them, to bring freedom to them. Verse 36, and those who had seen it told them how the demon-possessed man or the demonized man had been healed. Then all the people the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked him to depart from them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone begged him that he might be with him, but Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. And he went away, proclaiming throughout the whole city how much Jesus had done for him. And so these people are afraid. 
And if, if you think about last week, this is a theme, right? So, so the disciples are in the boat, and the storm comes, and, and what does the scriptures tell us? It tells us that they're afraid. And so, so Jesus calms the storm, and then what does it tell us they are then? They're afraid. And then so these people are afraid of the demonized man, and then Jesus releases the demon, gets it, like frees the captive, the demonized man, and what are the people? They're afraid of Jesus. There's this sense that someone with that much power should be feared. Someone who can speak to wind and waves should be feared. Someone who can speak to demons and they obey him should be feared. Only if you're his enemy. Only if you were God's enemy should you fear him. But here's the reality we were God's enemy. And Christ has come to set us free from the domain of darkness and bring us into the kingdom of light. So in Christ today, you are not his enemy, and although you should fear him, you don't have to. And although all the evidence should say this is someone whom you should be afraid of, you don't have to fear him. And so we... Don't fear Christ the same way they did because he had destroyed their economy. He had, he had taken the way they were making money and they removed it from them. But he freed the man and they asked Jesus to leave and he agrees to leave. But then the guy is begging him to, to go with them and Jesus says, no, you can't come with me. You're going to go um, tell them all that you have done, all that I have done for you. So it, it's funny to me because the, guy, the people beg Jesus to leave and Jesus kind of agrees to leave, Right? but then he sends someone to like go tell everyone about him. So he's like, he's like leaving, but he's kind of not leaving. Like he's like, I'll leave, but you know, you guys are still gonna hear about me. Uh, I trained this guy up, he's gonna go, he's gonna go do it, right? So this is, this is awesome. Like, like Jesus sends this guy out and the guy goes out, what does he do? He tells his story. He tells what God has done for him. This is why in home groups, we encourage you guys to share a story every week and someone shares their story. We think it's great that your home group gets to hear your story and to encourage you, but we also are training you to be able to share your story with others. It's why we put a 10-minute time on it. And for those of you who've gone over the 10 minutes, we let everyone do it their first time. But the, but the next time, we're like, hey, let's try and work this down to 10 minutes. Because here's the reality. If you're sharing your story, um, people just aren't going to listen to you for 45 minutes, even if it's a great story. Some of you guys' stories are captivating. But people are trying to listen, so we're trying to teach you, to train you to share your story. Not, not to change your story, but to be able to share what God has done in an amount of time that people can, be, can, can hear. And, and it's what God calls this man to do. And wh where, who does he do it with? Does, he, does, does Jesus say, hey, go um, into the next town and tell everyone? Go overseas and tell everyone? No, although people need to do that. Jesus is going back overseas, right? People need to do that, but what he tells the man is go back to your town. Go back to where I've placed you and tell them what the Lord has done for you. How much God has done for you. And so, Luke here slyly tells us that Jesus is God because Jesus says, return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. And he went away proclaiming throughout the whole city how much Jesus had done for him because Jesus is God. And, and Luke's showing us that by showing us that he has the ability to command winds and waves, and he has the ability to command the demons. So, so look, I don't want today the idea that demonization is still here today to scare anyone, because I want you to see who Jesus is and how he has control over even the demons that he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. That you don't have to fear, but you also don't just sit back and not even think about it, right? What, what should this drive us to do? What is the point of this story? Well, I think the point of the story is the point of the sermon the last two weeks, to be honest, and you're probably tired of hearing it. But Jesus is saying, be careful how you hear who are, who are Jesus' mother 
and his brothers are those who hear his words and obey them. See, even the winds and the waves hear his words and obey them. Even the demons hear his words and obey them. And next week we'll talk about even death hears his words and obeys them. But do you? Do you hear his words and obey them? Or do you hear his words and think, I'll do that later? I'll do it when I want. I'll get to that. Or just know, this is what I want to do. This is what's going to bring me joy, Jesus. I'm not going to follow you. You're trying to steal joy from me. No, we, 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 we hear Jesus' words, and we need to obey them because we need to believe not the lies of Satan that he's trying to rob us from joy, but the truth of Scripture that he's trying to lead us deeper into deeper into joy. It's Satan who lies to us and tells us that God's trying to steal something from you in his commands. But the reality, he's trying to give something to you in his commands. This should drive us to pray. I don't know anyone who prays more than, than people who have loved ones in a, in a physical war. Right? You, you talk to a, a mom whose son is, is overseas fighting in a war, and, and, and that's a mom who prays every day. And so if you could just realize that you are in, in the middle of a war, then you would pray and ask God, for help. If you knew there was something you could do every day that would protect you, that would give you strength, that would give you joy, not saying make you happy, give you everything you want, but to give you the things that you need, then you would do it. Like if there were, like I think Tim Keller puts it this way in his book called Prayer. If, uh, if, there, if you knew there was a pill that you had to take every day to live, you would never forget to take that pill. But the reason we don't pray is we don't actually believe rightly about what prayer does. And so prayer is, is, is protection for us. It's, it's how we fight. It's how we do these things. It's, it's, it, it is for us. We need to realize we are in war and we need to go to the one who's in control of this war. And then we also, like, like the uh, demonized man, we need, we need to know, and like Jesus, that in this war there are captives and the stakes are too high to sit back and do nothing. That like Jesus sit the demonized man or the, the, the man actually lacking, now lacking a demon, sends him back to his town to tell all that God has done. God has sent you to where you are to tell those people all that God has done. The fact that we're in a war and there's captives in this war should drive you to share about Jesus wherever God has placed you. I'm not, I'm not telling you to go somewhere new. I'm telling you like, like wherever you work, God has placed you there so that no one at your workplace would be far from God because you're there. Even though maybe, maybe like this is one of the things that drives me crazy. I'll probably get in trouble for this. If you want to email me, Zach at thegrovesp.com, okay? <laughs> I'll get to it. Um, people want to fight the whole like, they took God out of schools. It's like, they took, you know, man, our country's going downhill because they took God out of schools. Um, did they though? Like, can they? Is that possible? Or do you just need to train your kids better so that they can take Jesus with them to the school? Right? So, like, this just, like, this whole cultural war that we're fighting is so wrong. Like, if you're fighting the culture war and you're fighting against people, you're doing it wrong. Our war is fighting for people, not against them. If you're, if you're in here and you're, like, Republican, your Fox News is your thing, you're like, Tucker Carlson tonight, every night, right? And that's you? And you think this other side is you feel you're fighting against, you're not following Jesus. You're following Tuck. And you gotta stop. If it, maybe, maybe, maybe you're like an MSNBC C name person, you're like, I hate those people over there. They're trying to ruin our country. They hate, they hate people, they hate these things. Um, you're doing it wrong. Your war is not against people, it's for people. It's for them. There are captives. Golly. I just get so frustrated. Like, I love you guys. And I know everyone's going to be like, Zach, you got to get off Facebook. It's driving you crazy. But, but I got to see what you guys are doing because you guys are driving me crazy. <laughs> right? And like, like, I just, like, ignorance is not bliss. I want to know so I know how to preach and I know how to share with you guys that, like, your war is not against people. Man, wow, we had to fight this thing like a decade ago when everyone, like, I mean, oh, my gosh. So there was a, there's, and, and it's, it's starting to subside now, and I'm so thankful but there was a time where 
people who followed Jesus for decades legit thought that Muslim people were the enemy. No. They are captives. We bring the gospel to them. We lay our life down for them. The enemy is Satan and his demons. So if, if you've got this view that, that these people, whoever those people are, are the enemy, you, you just got to wake up. You're fighting a war that God does not want you to fight. But there is one. There's one that you get to participate in. God can win this thing without you. Did you know that? He doesn't need you to win this war. But that he has given it to you to be a part of it for your joy. He doesn't need you. He didn't. He did, you, you weren't there when he cast Satan out of heaven. He doesn't need you now on earth. But he wants you to be a part of what he's doing. You get to partake a part of the greatest story, the greatest drama that's ever unfolded on this earth. You get to be a part of it. Where God has placed you in your home, in your neighborhood, on your street. This, this, this week, I, uh, I struggled with this. I got so frustrated this week um, at my neighbor. I'm just, I'm just going to share it because I don't think, I'll oh, just be fine. I'm, repent, I'm repenting, but, but I need you guys to know why I got frustrated. Um, so our neighbors were kicking a soccer ball against their own house, which is fine. It's not my window they're going to break, right? I don't care. Um, but I, we told our kids, <laughs> do not kick that soccer ball. We share a yard. It's mostly our yard. That's a whole other frustration story. But, but um, they're kicking a soccer ball against their own house. And the other neighbor kid is partaking in, but our kids were like, you do not touch that soccer ball. You are not, not paying for a window. And so, sure enough, one, uh, the, one of the, the son of, of our neighbor, they kick the soccer ball, hits the window, breaks the window, and uh, we're pretty sure he got in pretty, bad, pr- pretty big trouble. But they kept doing it. So, my wife, because she's a saint, <laughs> goes out and buys, with our money, a soccer goal. And, and, and it's like a huge soccer goal. It's not like a little, like, um, you know, under six goal. It's like metal, and she finds it on, like, filled it, Facebook Marketplace or something. Man, that's cost us a lot of money, that place. But she, like, has this <laughs> soccer goal, and, 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 and she can't, like, she, I'm working. I don't even know this is going on. She, she calls her dad, and she's like, hey, will you help me pick up this soccer goal? And so they drive the truck over there, and they put it, they won't even fit in the truck, so it's, like, hanging over the cab. The kids are hanging on it. It's a huge, like, it's a big deal put the soccer goal up like a couple days later the kid jumps up and grabs the middle soccer goal and just bends it in half and I'm like man we're trying to save your windows here and you don't even care and so so I was getting getting a little frustrated okay and then here's the last last thing real quick Uh, on our porch we have this like decorative trash can it's not like it's not like a like a, like a plastic one it's a nice metal decorative trash can got it from Ikea it wasn't expensive but it's ours and, 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 and I, I come home, was it Friday? And, and, and it's laying in our yard. It's a black trash can. And, and it's, um, it's been spray painted blue. And I'm just like, that's weird. Because Margie spray paints a lot of things. And I was like, it's not, it's not done very well. And I was like, hey, babe, were you like, what happened with our trash can? She's like, I don't know. Our neighbor spray painted it. And I was like, I started like just losing it a little bit, okay? And I was like, what? It's like, because it's on our porch. And so like, that means someone came onto our porch, grabbed the trash can lid, took it back over to their house, because we don't have blue spray paint, and they, and they spray painted it blue and then threw it back in our yard. Now, I'm sure there was probably more to the story than that. But that's all I could think about. And so just so happens that the mom was out cleaning her car. So I marched over there. And I was like kind of nice, but not as nice as I should have been. So I'm going to have to repent. Now, I'm telling you guys first. I'm going to go talk to her later. Um, <laughs> But like, I was not, I was frustrated and, and, and I, I wasn't like fighting them, but I legit saw them as an enemy for a moment because of all the things that they were doing to us. Despite us helping them, despite us buying a soccer goal that our kids don't even use, putting it in our yard because they're always in our yard, they break it, they take our trash can, spray paint it blue, then they lie to us, that it was someone else, it was a whole thing. And for a moment I was just like, I can't believe our 
neighbors are doing this, our neighbors don't care, they don't respect us, they don't care. All these things was like, all, like and the reality is, I'm now preparing my sermon the rest of the week, and I'm thinking, oh man, they're not the enemy. Like, they just, they need to hear the gospel. They need to know what it's like, what God has done for them, and that they might um, do the same to others. And so, like, man, like, it just, just broke me for a moment that what I am getting frustrated with um, and, and, and people out on, like, larger scales thinking other people are their enemies, I, I'm doing myself with our actual neighbors who quite literally Jesus tells us to love. And so no matter, I know, I know it sounds so silly that our trash can was painted blue, blue, or that a soccer goal we don't even use was broken. I know some of you guys have been through horrific things. But you've got to hear that people are not the enemy. That the person that we see as the enemy could just be being used, influenced by, lied to, deceived by our actual enemy, Satan and his demons. And so what does that drive us to do? It drives us to pray. It drives us to share the good news of Christ with that person. Just like this demonized, demonized man did as he went back to his town and told everyone what Jesus had done for him. People are not the enemy, but we, there is a real enemy, and we need to get to work in setting the captives free because the, the kingdom of darkness cannot win. And it won't win, and we know that, but we get to be a part of that. So in Spruce Pine, or Burnsville, or the counties, whatever, however you want. I get in trouble every time I miss a ville or whatever. Um, all the places you guys live, you cannot let the darkness keep advancing. The only way to kill that which is dark is to spread the light. And so we've got to share Christ, be like Christ. Like, just imagine with me for a moment, and then we'll pray. Imagine what it would be like in our towns. If the people of God were so saturated with the gospel, so influenced by the gospel, so heard the words of Jesus and obeyed them, that your neighbors, your coworkers, the, the, the kid at Ingalls who's always on his phone, the, the, the person who gets your coffee always wrong, people who, like the, the waitresses, all these people that you get frustrated with, what if, what if they experienced Jesus through word and deed every single day because of the way you guys were living and talking? Imagine what that would do to our community. Imagine what that would do to um, the marriages in our community. Imagine what that would do to the, uh, the, the kids growing up in school in our community. Imagine what it would do to those who are addicted to drugs in our community. Like, just imagine what it would be like if we took this seriously, this idea of, of do you hear Jesus and are you listening to him? And we actually did that, what that could do for our towns. What kind of culture we might be living in. Because as much as the culture war isn't about people, it is a real thing. And, and, and we, we are meant to be, as a church, a culture within a culture, trying to influence the greater culture more and more and more as we push back that's what, that, that which is dark in our, in our hearts, uh, in our own hearts and in the lives of those around us. Man, so I, I just want to, to, to beg you guys to join the mission to join the fight, to pray. Pray for your towns, pray for, your, pray for yourself, pray for your kids, pray for, for the kids of others, to pray for the people who frustrate you, your neighbors, and just to pray for our communities, and then to actually go out and listen to Christ and do what he's called us to. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you for this story. As weird as it can be, as much as my fear is that people will either be too excited or think that I have one because I talk about it too much, but I, Lord, I just pray that uh, your word would be heard as it just echoes in our ears this morning, that, uh, that we would hear your word and we'd obey it. We wouldn't just have the right Christology, the right 
um, views of who you are and who your son is and what he came to do, Lord, but we'd actually, that would actually change us. It would drive us to repentance. It would drive us to faith. It would drive us to, to obedience. And, and, and ultimately, all that would culminate into our joy. And Lord, so just be with us as we respond this morning and worship you, the one who came to set the captives free, many of whom are in this room now, free because of what Christ did on the cross. We love you. Pray this in your son Jesus' name. Amen.